Welcome to a Toast to Truth. This is where I share the mental, financial, and emotional frustrations of being an entrepreneur. This is season eight, episode two, Finding the Right Business for You. And I have a special guest co-host, and I'm going to be very careful pronouncing this name, Sahil Lavinia. He is the CEO of Gumroad, and you can read his bio on the show notes. But I always like to share with the listeners, if you're new, how I met the guest co-host. So I have actually been a customer of Gumroad probably at least five, maybe maybe even more than that, years. Um, a friend, she used Gumroad for one of her events. And I was like, what is this? Because I'm not an event bright person. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I just don't like the platform. So I saw she was using it. And I said, okay, you know, I'll check it out. So I've seen the growth. And, um, and then on Twitter, I saw that they were looking for um, some podcasts for the CEO to kind of um, be on. And I said, that works perfectly because I have actually been a customer. And um, unlike other people, I'm very loyal to the products that I <laughs> <laughs> that I use. So it only made sense for one of my favorite um, e-commerce platforms to actually introduce you all to the CEO because you know I've been talking about it for years. I've kind of recommended, especially those who have nonprofits, I say kind of use Gumroad more than GoFundMe. That way you still get your money from the people who are donating instead of trying to reach a certain amount. But um, we'll get into that and a lot more in this conversation. So let's go ahead and do the question for you guys to kind of think about. What does it take to discover what type of business you should have? So now, you know, um, Sahil, everyone, especially with the shutdown, everyone's talking about entrepreneurship, even mm -hmm. more so. Like before yeah. it was always, you know, don't ever trust a job. Everyone needs to be an entrepreneur. And my thing is, who's gonna be the customers? <laughs> <laughs> but with you, mm -hmm. but with you, your audience, your customer base are actually entrepreneurs. Yeah. And so for people who want to become an entrepreneur, you know, how can they discover, like, you know, finding the right business for them? Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. I think that's true, um, especially in times that are difficult. It's mm -hmm. kind of this weird thing that happens. And it, you think it'd be the opposite, you know, because really uh, I feel like you'd want to, you'd want to take advantage of an opportunity, right? Like the market's doing super well, but actually, yeah, when the market is down and things aren't looking as good, that's when people typically start companies or should be in my opinion. Um, and I think the reason is because I think you want to start a company that is really important and really meaningful. And if you're, if you're doing it in a super opportunistic way, you know, sometimes that can get lost. Because mm -hmm. people have a ton of disposable income, people are spending money on all sorts of things, and that's fine. But for me, what I get excited about is creating a service, and that's really what you're creating, right? You're creating a service for people um, that becomes essential, becomes super, super, super important, you know. And with Gumroad, like I have no worry at all with the market going haywire because I know. Honestly, look, the worse the market does, like the more meaningful, the more important that a service like the one that we've built is going to matter for people. I yeah. really think so, too, because more people um, may take the initiative mm -hmm. to test out the waters, even if they, you know, go back to their nine to five, yeah. they still have that. And for someone who's used Gumroad, it's not that hard to set up. So mm -hmm. it's not like yeah. the person is actually putting a lot of yeah. time into creating yeah. um, their, their pay. Totally. Yeah. And I think it's important to talk about what you don't need, mm -hmm. you know, to, to make the leap, because I think a lot of people think the leap is needs to be a leap. It needs to be this crazy uh, decision. <laughs> <laughs> and it really doesn't, you know, Gumroad, I can just talk about, the way that we started it, it was a weekend project. I was fully employed. I was working at Pinterest as an early employee. And I just had this idea. I had this pencil icon that I designed in Photoshop that I just wanted to similar, you know, test out the waters and see if I could sell it to my small audience on the internet at the time. And 
there wasn't really a good way for me to do that. You know, there are these like massive marketplaces, like I stock photo or whatever. And I was like, I don't need that. Like I already have an audience. Like I just want to sell this thing for a dollar, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't need like a target store. I just need a lemonade stand, you know, and there wasn't a way to do that. And so I just built over the course of a weekend, you know, that I designed that icon Friday night and then shipped Gumroad, the first iteration of it, Monday morning, you know, wow. um, cause it was, you know, super, super, super simple, had very minimal functionality and it was enough you know, 50,000 people saw it that first day, you know, and that's not to say that, you know, we were experiencing crazy growth and revenue and traction, but it was interesting, you know, it, it's, it struck a nerve. And if I think I spent a month, two months, a year, like really like quit it, quit my job, building the whole thing out, like it might, might even have lost some of that appeal, right? Because some, I think some of that appeal was like, oh, wow, you, this is interesting. And it only took a little bit of time to build. Like there's something really compelling here, right? And I think a lot of services you look at today, obviously they might have thousands of employees. They might be, you know, multi-year projects, but they started off really, really, really simple. Instagram, I mean, you could build Instagram in a, in a weekend. You could build Twitter. Yeah, there, you know, you could go online and you search like Twitter Ruby clone or something and you could find an open source version of Twitter. And I think that just signifies how fundamental the idea is because it was so it's such a simple change in the way that we think I mean, yeah and for people like me who like things simple because i'm not a i'm not a tech person i tell people that all the time like i cry if something happens to my blog technical <laughs> <laughs> why because i'm just like i don't even know what to do and i'll call yeah. like the geek squad or i'll call the hosting company and i'm just like someone has to help me because <laughs> <laughs> you you are my tech team but for someone like me um, who came from education. So I was a public school teacher because before I became a full-time blogger. So I, we didn't use a lot of technology. I worked at a title one school, so we didn't use a lot of, a lot of technology in the classroom. And then for me to move, I guess you could say in somewhat of a tech space. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when people wanted me to start selling things or they wanted to pay me, I needed something other than PayPal that could take payment but wasn't going to cause me a headache wasn't going to like overwhelm me so when i found gumroad i was really really <laughs> pleased um with that but for people who are trying to figure out like what businesses they they should start like um the example of those two sisters from maryland who started the cheesecake um business they they both work for the government and they're both furloughed and so um over the christmas break they made cheesecake for their family and their family said this is really good and that kind of stuck up um sparked an idea for them mm -hmm. um so i don't know if they're going to continue with it or not but and you mentioned when the when the economy goes down that's when you know people start thinking of ideas mm -hmm. how would someone who's like i want to start a business but i don't exactly know what i want to do mm -hmm. how would they figure out like where would that yeah. spark come yeah, I mean, often, especially looking backwards, you realize that, like, the idea has been trending around in your head for a while. Okay. Mm -hmm. sense, right? So, it's, it's, I think it's a little uh, dangerous or just inefficient to sort of sit down and say, I need to start a business. Like, what business is that going to be? Because I've tried doing that before, and I, I have lots of ideas, and the minute I do that, I have no ideas. They just all, <laughs> they all just disappear. I and I think part of it is you need to be receptive. And the minute you're trying to like think Force of something, mm -hmm. all the ideas sound terrible. You know, like your your bar is too high. You know, um, and yeah, I think I think it, it's really being mindful just as you go about your day, as you go about your job, if you have one. Like, just think think about the things that you like doing the things that generally attract you anyways, the things that you end up doing on the weekend for fun, you know, um, especially in the age of social media and things today, like people, I think are constantly surprised with the things that you can do and earn, and earn a full time living doing. It's just being open to, to, to doing that and being, and taking it seriously, you know, um, with, with Gumroad, like I, always had a passion for democratizing things. I always had a passion for making things like super, super easy 
and non-technical um, that previously used to be technical and only reserved for like certain types of businesses that were able to hire the staff to build their own e-commerce solution. You know, at Pinterest, it was similar. We wanted to take this idea of scrapbooking and like people, uh, you know, using the Internet Explorer bookmarks folder and like building a really nice, simple, beautiful software to do similar thing, right? You know, mm-hmm. Pinterest isn't that innovative. It's not just some crazy idea. It's just like, oh, let's just take this thing that used to be physical or used to be a kind of, a, a, you know, a thing that people familiar with tech would do and make it accessible to everybody else. Um, and, you know, I've had other, uh, built other things before, before that. And so I think a lot of it is just figuring out what you care about, not on like a business level, but on like just a personal level. Like what, I, what, what trends in humanity are you excited about? Are you excited about, um, you know, food? Are you excited about travel? Are you excited about fitness? Um, I have friends, you know, from high school that I'll hang out with and they'll be like, Oh, it's so cool that you're doing this stuff. And you, you know, I have no ideas. Like I, I, like I, <laughs> or like, I don't like doing anything for like, I don't have hobbies. People say that all the time. I don't have hobbies. Like, I don't know what I would do. And I'm like, well, I'm sure you do. You just don't think of them like hobbies because there's, that's what you do. You know, when you look at somebody else who's different from you, it's used to be like, Oh, you do this weird thing that I don't do. Right. But I look at you and I'm like, you do this other weird thing that I don't, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Um, If you like talking to people and having conversations, like doing a podcast, right? Like there's, there's all of these ideas that I think some people just don't see as real opportunities, uh, but they totally are. Right. Yeah. It's like right in front of them or they think it's just too simple of an idea. um, Or too small. I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, um, oh, one fun fact, I was on a scrapbooking team in high school, and we actually <laughs> went on to competitions. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> it is. Well, at least here in Texas, it's a thing. Because yeah, uh, we would go to San Antonio. It was with the Spanish club. So um, within the Spanish clubs, and I don't know if they still do it, but you could have a scrapbooking team. And so I was always on the, and we won every year until my senior year because the president of the Spanish club did not follow the rules. And we kept telling him that's not what we're supposed to do to um, enter our scrapbook. And he was like, well, I'm the president, I'm in charge. And we got disqualified. We were like, <laughs> you need to like find another way back home or something. Cause we, had, we had won like six, seven years in a row and then we lose because of a technicality. And we were just, especially as seniors, we're like, we, this is our senior yeah. year. You know, we were going to go four years in a row, but yeah. So I know people are like, what is that? Yeah. It's the thing. Mm-hmm. They're, they're scrapbooking <laughs> teams for high schoolers. So when I saw Pinterest, I was like, Oh yeah, I can get into this, you know, mm-hmm. but I, I still like the, the physical scrap. Yeah. But oh. to going back to what you were saying about it being small, like people's ideas being small, mm-hmm. um, sometimes they, people don't understand niche. Like mm-hmm. they feel that if they focus in on one or two areas that they're going to miss out on all this other mm-hmm. money. But at the same time, sometimes your niche can be too mm-hmm. small if you're not paying attention. So what would you say to someone about a niche? Yeah. Yeah. I think especially with the internet and social media, like I think sometimes people underestimate how large a niche can be, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, like there's, you know, people that literally make a full time living posting photos of their cat on Instagram. (laughs) I I don't know. You gotta, you gotta, I think be open to the, to the idea that, that you don't need some, you know, you don't need some huge, uh, you know, people call it TAM, right? Total addressable market. Um, with Gumroad, we wanted to focus on just digital content initially and just focus on digital content creators as our audience and our customer base. And people were like, why would you, what is it a creator? I don't even know what a creator is. Like, do they make physical, you know, like it was just a weird word. And now you say creator, I feel like, it's only been five plus a little bit, you know, five, seven years. And everyone's like, oh yeah, creator. Yeah. YouTube creator, Kickstarter creators, government creators, Patreon yeah. creators, creators. And you know, so it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot um, for these things to change. But yeah, I think, I think just picking a niche is re- a niche is really about like, what can you become a leader in? 
right? If I want, like, if I was like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, like I'm just going to build a huge business that is just so broad, right? And you're competing with everybody and there's nothing interesting about your story. And I think the, a good business initially says no to the vast majority of its customers to focus on a core set. And so, you know, for example, if I was incredibly fit, which I'm not, and I wanted to create a fitness Instagram, I wouldn't just do a fitness Instagram. I try to figure out like what niche can I, can I uh, appeal to, right? This is basically how CrossFit became a huge thing, right? Mm -hmm. Or how couch to 5k, these are all under the umbrella of fitness, but they chose a very specific um, angle. Uh, the other nice thing about specificity, um, a couple of nice things about specificity. One is that it creates in it a tremendous amount of loyalty from your customers, right? Because if, if you're soul cycle and you have a very specific way of doing things, it's like joining a tribe. It's like, you know, you're, you're signing up for a very specific type of thing and that no one else is offering. And so if you, if it matches what you like to do, it's, you have a customer for life, right? Basically. Yeah. Um, it also makes marketing a lot easier because people will say, okay, well, what about you? What's different about you? But if what's different about you is core to what you do, it's very easy, right? Versus a lot of, I think a lot of people like, they're like, oh, we're just a bakery. And that is so difficult to market because inevitably your marketing messages were like that bakery, but we're better. And that, <laughs> that doesn't yeah. mean anything. Everyone says that like, it's very hard to know. Right. And so you have to figure out like, okay, what, what can you replace better with? Like we're, we're, a, we're a bakery, but we only do gluten free or we only do chocolate or we only do, you know, breakfast pastries or whatever it is. And I guarantee you that Instagram ad for that breakfast pastry bakery is going to do outperform any, any you know, a, a general bakery. And it doesn't really matter. Like, obviously like you should have good quality product. Um, but people aren't even going to walk in the door unless there's something interesting about you, something that makes them remember you. Um, and so this, honestly, the smaller you can get, the better, in my opinion, it's almost too hard to get too small. Uh, and the reason is you can always grow past that, right? You're never mm -hmm. stuck. You can always say, Oh, now we're doing X, Y, Z. We're doing sandwiches or whatever. We're doing catering. Um, it doesn't stop there. No one's forcing you to stick to what you're doing. Um, but definitely in the early days, I think, I think a lot of people end up becoming too optimistic about their business and then they, they don't succeed. And then, you know, they give up and they so, get really discouraged. Mm -hmm. yeah, they get super discouraged. It's kind of like couch to 5k, right? Like you might want to run the marathon, but if you tell yourself you're going to run a marathon, like you might get discouraged. You might run five miles the first day and then, feel like you never want to walk again and then never, <laughs> you know never go for a run ever again versus if you're starting small you're you know it's it's so much it's so much less stressful and your milestones are doable you feel like you can accomplish them and when you do you can say okay i'm going to go for this thing i can go for the next thing um at least that's the way that i think about it um that has worked worked for me and i think we always tell our creators you know, we have pay what you want pricing. You can charge zero plus for something people can donate. Like these are all ways to start small and to test the waters out. Um, and the really, really cool thing, especially about the internet and selling digital content is that it's infinitely scalable. So you might think that you're starting small and just trying out stuff. And then you might wake up the next day and like 50,000 people are, are knocking on your door which can't happen with a physical business, right? Yeah. That's an entire, it's, I have, there's many examples, I think, of people that are like, oh yeah, I'll try out this thing. I'll post this video. Uh, you know, like that one, that uh, yodeling boy at Walmart, right? Oh yeah. Like, and then boom, like he's on Ellen like a month later, you know, and you has just a, never know what takes off. Yeah. You're, and yeah, you, you never know what's going to happen. And I think, I think if he was, you know, if he produced his, old, you know, that was like, a, I don't know, 40 second clip, right? Like mm -hmm. not produced at all. Like, and he was sharing something that he was clearly passionate about. Um, like those are all signs of a good business, a good a, a person that's thinking about trying to figure out how they can do a, make a living doing what they love the right way and guess what now he is right and he's like eight or something uh, it's kind of like the little um 
I guess he's what five, six the little kid who does the toy reviews on yeah. YouTube. I'm like, why are these kids watching? And then I saw, I guess, a meme or something talking about, um, you know, kids watch him review yeah. the toys, but then they say, but adults watch HTV talking about, <laughs> don't use that tile with that floor. I'm like, okay, touche. Yes, we do that. <laughs> But you said some really good things. I was taking some notes, and I hope the people who are listening were taking notes as well. I'm going to start with the, the discouraged part. One thing I know from the blogging world, um, a lot of people feel if they don't make $100,000 in their first year of blogging, then like, there's no point in continuing. And I'm just like, very hard. It's not hard, but it's hard to make $100,000 when you don't have anything to sell. Because a lot of them don't have anything yeah. to sell. So I'm like, yeah. how do you think you're going to get to, <laughs> you know, a hundred thousand dollars that way? Mm -hmm. um, and then when you mentioned that you guys targeted just the digital creators. Um, yeah. A lot of people didn't know what that word was because I would mm -hmm. use that word and they're like, so what do you do? <laughs> and I'm like, the first syllable create, you know? <laughs> and so, yes, it, it mm -hmm. goes to names. Um, or I guess you could say new terminology, mm -hmm. new terminology in the business world. Mm -hmm. um, and then I want, um, before we head to, to break, I want you to explain TAM for people who mm -hmm. may not know what that yeah. is. Totally. Yeah. So TAM is T-A-M, Total Addressable Market. It's sort of an out, a little bit of an outdated business term, but it, it's basically if you, if you sold to every single customer that your business is, you know, appeals to, because obviously, obviously you can't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, in the, especially in the early days, like how large is that, is that possibility? So for example, if you're a bakery in a city of 50,000 people, like how many people in that city buy baked goods, how often things like that. And you figure out, okay, that's, you know, 10,000 people and average customers, buying $50 worth of baked goods a year. So that's 50 times 10,000. So that's $500,000 a year or something. Right. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. My um, mom was a math teacher, but I am not a math <laughs> <kid>. <laughs> um, And then, you know, you can always grow that. Right. Um, but yeah, it's just a way of, it's a way of making sure that if everything works out for you, you have a large enough business to achieve whatever goals you set out to do. So if you're starting a blog, making sure that you think about and you do comps, which is like you look at other, other businesses, other blogs, and you make sure that, you know, you're, you're thinking about it the right way. Because the nice thing about thinking about TAM is it, it makes you do your research mm -hmm. and really understand the market and how much people are spending, um, how big, how many people are spending at all, um, and what the opportunities are. Um, and often if you do that research, you might even fa find a better business. That's probably less sexy, which is why I didn't think of it at first, but probably has more opportunity in there. Instead of being a bakery, you can be a caterer or something like that, you know, cause you might do research in a bakeries and you, re you realize like 80% of their sales are actually um, catering events or, or what have you. That happens all the time in the restaurant business, for example. Um, and so, yeah, it's just being, it's being mindful of, of your, of your, of your potential as, as a, as a business. Um, I, I would say that definitely, um, I guess I did it without realizing, um, because I was speaking with a, uh, she's more of a branding coach last year. She came from Atlanta to Houston to host an event. And so I went to her event. I've known her, um, for some years and she asked me, she was like, Vernetta, you know, what is it that you want to do with your blog? Because I know you, you feel kind of stuck. And I had to think about it for a while. It took me a, probably a month, month and a half. And then I ended up going to Atlanta to another event she was hosting. And by that time, I had an answer. And like you said, sometimes you realize that you're working in one direction. And all the while you're making money or something else clicks and you're not paying attention. And so um, I started focusing more on events because I realized I was actually getting paid more for events or event marketing and not paying attention to that. I was always trying to create another service or another product in a totally different area and kept wondering why is this such a hard upstream, you mm -hmm. know, battle to sell this 
without sitting down and really looking at, oh, you know, you're not having to work as hard in this particular area. So since then, you know, a lot more doors have opened and more opportunities. Um, because currently I'm working with like Live Nation and Cirque du Soleil with their um, event here in Houston. So yeah, it, it's, it's those things that we're just like, oh, you know, when you finally sit down, you're like, yes, that is working. Why did I not see that? How much time and money have I <laughs> lost um, since then? So we're going to take a quick sip and then we'll be right back. So I'm very particular about what I recommend and use. As a loyal user over the past five years, I chose to use Gumroad as my e-commerce platform. It's great for digital creatives like me and you. I have watched it transform to be more user-friendly, which helps when we just want to upload our work and begin selling in less than five minutes. I've also used it for memberships, ticket sales, consultations, and digital training videos to name a few ways to use the platform. So far, they've put $175 million in the pockets of creators around the world, only taking a 5% cut. Not bad. Would you like to join an e-commerce platform that brings in that type of money for its users? Go to gumroad.com backslash invites with an S to sign up today. Okay, so we are back and we're talking about trying to find your, you know, the right business for you and you, so he'll focus mainly initially on digital creators, but I know um, Gumroad can be used for so many different types of ways. Um, when I was over a blog association, we used it for membership dues mm -hmm. um i found that easier instead of me having to send invoices or something every month it just you know mm -hmm. does that um mm -hmm. i have used it for events where i didn't charge so mm -hmm. people can do that like you said it could be zero plus um i have used it for consultations i have used it for events that people have paid for i mean there's just an array mm -hmm. so now i believe you could sell physical products mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, on there. So if someone didn't want to use like Amazon or Shopify, how mm -hmm. would that work for their physical well, product? Yeah. So we started supporting that a few years ago. Um, and it's a double digit percentage of, of the platform now. And yeah, it's super simple. Our, you know, our mentality is always like, how can we make this easy and understandable for creators? Um, not for businesses. We're not focused on, you know, people just trying to sell 30 SKUs and things like that. Um, but it's similar to, you know, creating a digital product. You go in there, you add a product. And the big difference is you just, you know, you just uh, set your shipping destinations. You set the places that you want um, to ship to. Uh, and that's super important because, you know, you, with a digital product, really great because you can have customers everywhere in the world. With physical product, you don't want that to be the default because if someone buys your product halfway around the world, then you're in charge of getting it to them, right? And so we start with no countries and then you add, you add shipping destinations. And that's really it. And it's super simple. You're still in charge of shipping and packaging, labeling and all that stuff. We just help with the collection of the information, the payment, the receipt, the invoice, things like that. And we want to do more with physical uh, this year um, because more and more people are, you know, tired of like Ticktail just uh, announced they're shutting down. And so there's more opportunity, I think, for us if we decide to get into merchandise, things like that as well. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Um, I did physical products for a while. I did journals. Um, but for me, it was just easier to sell through the journal platform because I, I didn't want to order from them and then have to ship them. You know, I felt it was double um, that way to do that. Now, for people who are like, um, I have this physical product and 
everyone keeps saying I should go to somewhere like Shopify. Mm-hmm. Um, because in a lot of Facebook entrepreneur Facebook groups, I mean, Shopify seems to be like the number one mm-hmm. place. But you mentioned that from earlier um, that you guys are more like lemonade stand. So mm-hmm. would you say that Gumroad would be a great starting for someone mm-hmm. who's um, just wants to get up and started, get their products out there? Mm-hmm. Um, so how would you, I don't, I don't want to say compare to Shopify because mm-hmm. I have heard some stories from Shopify, how confusing mm-hmm. it can be to, yeah. to get it together when they're trying to get their products on there. Yeah, it's Shopify can be pretty intimidating, I think, because yeah. it's mostly built for businesses, right? And often the it's often for people that have physical businesses, retail businesses already and are sort of adding an online component. So they're a little bit more sort of down the down the, the life the life cycle of a of a business. But they have a bunch of SKUs, they already have sales, they already have like a shipping operation that they figured out, things like that. Um, yeah, Gumroad is a great way to start because yeah, as you mentioned, it's the lemonade stand. It's really easy to say, Hey, I'm, I'm, I want to try this thing out and you can get, you know, there's a hundred shirts, right. With my logo on it that you can purchase. Um, and it's really, 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 really simple. Um, and sometimes it's too simple, frankly. And I think we want to add more functionality, but sometimes people say, Hey, I want to do, you know, I want to sell all these three different products. And if you buy two, it's, you know, shipping is in, is included and I want free shipping above this amount and I want to do weight based stuff. And we're just not there yet. We just don't have that level of complexity. And so if you're trying to do that sort of stuff, like until we have it, which at some point, hopefully we will, I think Shopify is, is great. I mean, you know, I'm sure, you know, very many people use them and, and Shopify is an amazing platform for sure. Um, but I think if you're just getting started and you're not ready to commit, um, and really investigate and figure out how, how that stuff works. You just want to try something out. I think Gumroad can be, can be a really good way to do that. And there are ways to, do, to test that demand, even without selling a product, right? You can collect emails. You could do all sorts of, you know, you could throw an event in your city. There's tons of ways to, to gauge demand. And can you um, explain what a SKU is for, yes. for people who may not, be familiar with that term. Yeah, a SKU is. Oh man, I don't even know if the if I know. <laughs> it's like I know. I think it's something something unit, but it basically means a SKU is is each. It's it's like an inventory item, right? So if you if you're selling three colors of T-shirts in three different sizes, small, medium, large for red, yellow, and blue, then you have nine SKUs. You basically have nine unique physical items. Oh, okay. um, and it's just a way of thinking about like the way, you know, if you're working with a drop shipper, if you're working with this, like you, each SKU sort of has an identification tag and you can, so you can easily track inventory and make sure you're, you know, you're reconciling everything properly. Uh, with digital, you don't have SKUs really because it's just, everything's automated, right? You sell four products, you get paid. Those things are emailed out automatically. You're good to go. Um, but when you're dealing with, you know, when you when you're dealing, for example, with physical, you have to think about things like warehousing, drop shipping, refunds, returns, exchanges. You have to think about. I mean, you don't have to think about all these things, but the reason Shopify is so complicated is enough businesses do that. They've built out all this crazy stuff, and then when you're getting started, you're like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Um, <laughs> and then oh, also, you know, uh, when you when you typically when you buy physical things, they end up depreciating over time, right? So you have to think about you know, okay, we didn't sell all these shirts. What do we do with them? Where do we put them? Um, all these sorts of things. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we've always shied away from that. And we're like, we're, we're Shopify and some other platforms are good enough at physical. Like I'm, we're going to focus on a thing that we, we think enough people aren't focusing on, um, which is, which is, which is digital. And we're going to be the best at that. And that's, I guess some, one thing I would like to add, um, is that think about what you can do because the smaller you go, the better your chances at being the best answer to that problem. Right. And I think some, a problem with starting too broad is that you're never going to be the best. Uh, and so it's because, you know, if there's already people out there, like obviously it's going to take you time. So 
I always try to keep that as a, as a restriction on what I'm doing. Can I truly be the best solution? Because if I came on here and I was like, Gummert is great. We're like the number three uh, best way to do this. Like, that's just not that exciting, right? And it's really <laughs> right. hard. It's really hard to, to, to build a business being, being second best, being third best. Especially, you can do it physically because things like location, uh, things like that matter more physically, right? You're willing to settle if you don't want to drive 30 minutes to the next best, to the better, whatever. But digitally, when, any, you know, when, when anyone can switch whenever they want and price compare all the time, like you really got to be the best. It's kind of like um, Chick-fil-A and everyone else. Um, yeah, Chick-fil-A is the best. I agree with that. And then <laughs> like, I would say the only exception to that would be Burger King because Burger King is like number two to McDonald's. But mm -hmm. it seems like Burger, Burger King still gets um, the, the support or the recognition mm -hmm. of a number one, even though they're yeah. clearly number two by <laughs> totally. many yeah, terms yeah. and everything. <laughs> that often, might be yeah, often exception. you can get that happens, especially with, with, for some reason it happens with food a lot, right? You have like mm -hmm. Pepsi, Coke. Yeah. You know, in Utah and the Midwest, you have a uh, Southwest or whatever. You have Cafe Rio and Costa Vida. Like you have, you definitely have Chipotle, Cadavo. Um, but yeah, you just got to understand, would you rather be a McDonald's or a Burger King? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, most people I think would rather be McDonald's. And I think starting today, you have to be in some capacity better. And I think even, even Burger King, like, I think they're smart in that they often don't say we make better burgers than McDonald's. What they say is we have the Whopper, right? We have a thing. We're the best at the Whopper because no one else makes that taste profile. Um, and so I think they're smart, too, in which they've been able to kind of almost collude and say, we're going to go after this market and we're going to, you know, you're going to go after this market. And it seems to work. I think... Um, Pepsi Coke is, is similar, Lyft, Uber. Um, but it's less, I think, about being number two, I think, and, 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 and figuring out a, a way to message yourself, market yourself as a number one just for a different need. Yeah, because Burger King, at least in Texas growing up, Burger King burgers were always targeted to hungry men. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, everything is supposed to be bigger and better in Texas. So they would, mm -hmm. you know, the double Whopper and the double yeah. Whopper with bacon. So it would always, um, their burgers were always targeted towards men. And my mm -hmm. father, when he would take us to go eat, it would be the Burger King and he would get the burger that he wanted. And we're just sitting there like, we mm -hmm. can't eat this big old, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this big old burger. So the marketing worked because yeah. they would go. But um, he would end up buying us all the same burger, you know, the <laughs> one he got. And I'm just like, okay, you know, that's, that's kind of not um, how it works. But, you know, he tried. <laughs> um, one thing I do want to ask is, you know, what is something that didn't go well or um, work out the way you wanted as you were building Gumroad? because we talked about being discouraged earlier mm -hmm. and yet here you are years later, you know, mm -hmm. it's continuing to grow. Um, I know you guys helped raise money for Puerto Rico and India last year mm -hmm. with um, the hurricane in Puerto Rico and then the flooding that happened mm -hmm. in, in that um, province in India. So what didn't work out if you want to mm -hmm. share that and, and how did you get yeah. past that? Yeah. Yeah, I think the hardest thing for us has, has probably always been um, being comfortable with the rate of growth that we were at, um, especially being in San Francisco in this crazy venture funded lifestyle and like ecosystem um, when things are growing like crazy. Um, when you're focused on digital content creators, it was just a much smaller market and they're growing at a much steadier rate. The great thing about it is that it's still growing and the numbers are, you know, as a percentage are always getting larger and larger and larger, um, which is really exciting. But it is one of those things that just takes a lot of time, you know? And it's funny, a lot of people nowadays are like, oh my gosh, like it's so cool that you built this thing and all these people are using it and it's such a great business and I wish I could have done it. And I'm like, 
I've been working on this thing for a lot. Like, <laughs> I'm glad. Like, thank you. I appreciate that for sure. But I don't, don't be jealous because, you know, it's not an overnight success. Like it's been, you know, almost seven and a half years of working on this thing, which is a long time in tech, you know? Yeah. Um, and it, I think, it, I think being discouraged is often is a time thing. It's, it's not seeing things fast enough. And, you know, there's a great, I can't remember where it's from, but it, you know, maybe Seven Habits of Highly Effective People are one of those books that everyone loves. Um, but it was basically this idea that, like, the one thing that separates people from being successful and people that aren't is giving up, right? Mm-hmm. Like, at the end of the day, like, every single person that is unsuccessful decided, made a choice to give up, which is fine. I'm not saying don't give up, and it's good to know if something's not working. But often, People, are, people give up, I think, a little bit too early, right before they might have discovered the new thing, right? I, I like to use the example of, of uh, BBM, right? Blue, uh, Blackberry Messenger. You know, Blackberries were huge, and then they started to die, and they basically died. And, I mean, they're still around, but not nearly successful. And then, right, everyone was like, oh, yeah, like, PDAs and all that stuff. Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, that's not going to happen. And then like two years later, the iPhone becomes like the best selling technology device of all time. So you never know, right? You flip was bought by uh, AOL or some, somebody like that for $700 million selling tiny video cameras. And they basically went bankrupt a couple, you know, it's around the same period. GoPro became a massive thing doing a very similar thing, but for a different market. And so I don't know. It's, it's always easy to, you know, just to say, Oh, I, I knew that, but really no one knows. And I think the most important thing for me has always been to work on it, give it time and be comfortable with it, not growing as fast as I want. Um, because you never know, right. With Gumroad, for example, I told myself, I'm going to work on this thing for five years. I'm going to raise enough money that I don't have to think about anything else for five years. And now it's been over seven. But I think if I, if two years in, you know, if I looked at those numbers and I was like, oh, maybe I should do something else. But no, I told myself, I told the team, I told the investors, I'm going to give it five years because it's going to take that time. Uh, the other thing that I think is really important is to do something that you really like doing because it's a lot easier to give up when you don't actually like the thing you're doing, right? If you're in it purely right. for the money and two years in, you're not making any money, it's a lot easier to say, okay, never mind, I'll go work on something else. But if you really love doing the thing, at least you can say, okay, well, I'm not making that much money, but I love doing this thing. I'm getting better. I'm learning a lot. Um, I'm having fun. I'm meeting cool people. Those are reasons to do a business too, right? And um, personal growth. And eventually, hopefully, those things will turn into enough money that you can sustain it as well. But I think putting the cart before the horse, like you don't want to get too caught up in, for example, creators, they're always like, how can I make more money? And the, uh, uh, the answer is often you got to build an audience. You, you got to figure out how you can give them more value so that you can build your audience and so that they can really trust you and, and really appreciate what you're doing and, and respect you and, and, and tell their friends and all that stuff. And then you can worry about making money. Um, because often there's no secret, right? There's no, like I guarantee you if there was a secret to making money, everyone would do it and it would no longer work. Right. Like <laughs> yes. it's really hard and it takes a long time to build an audience, to get really good at a certain thing, to learn how to teach it, to network, to do these partnerships, to get these clients. And then it looks easy. Cause it's like, Oh, you're not even selling anything that hard to make. And it's like, well, yeah, but I spent 10 years learning all these other things in order to do that. Right. And I think sometimes people like I'm, I paint as a hobby and in five minutes or 10 minutes, someone can paint something that is just incredible. And I'm like, how did that only take you five minutes? I can never do that. I could do that. Once I've seen you do it, I can copy you and do a pretty okay job. But how did like five minutes and really what it is is, well, it's a, it's decades of things in their brain that they've spent the time to learn, right? And they can yeah. sell that five minute painting for a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, right? Um, Cause they have that audience, they have that skill and they have scarcity. 
around those originals. Um, but it would be super naive and frankly depressing if, if anyone was like, and discouraging at least, to, to look at that and be like, I can't do that in five minutes. That's not fair. Yeah. I can't do that in, in a, a week. <laughs> well, and it goes back to the craft. Like, like they studied their craft. They took the time to yeah. put in um, the hours and, and learn about it. And the more you learn about your craft, the quicker and easier it is for you to kind of put things um, out there. Mm-hmm. And, and one thing you m- I mentioned that kind of um, – gave me something I want to share with the listeners. Um, A lot of the listeners have followed me since my second blog, Women Are Game Changers. Mm -hmm. And when I started that blog, I really didn't have an idea of what I wanted to do with it. I just knew I wanted to have a positive voice for everyday women. Um, Mm -hmm. And then over time, the audience kind of helped shape and, and shift it. And I eventually sold it. But I take it I take that time as me learning mm-hmm. the the craft, not mm-hmm. so much the, yeah. the niche, but more so I learned the craft. And so, you know, in certain groups and circles here in Houston, I'm very well known as a blogger because mm-hmm. of that time that I put yeah. in with Women Are Game Changers. So now that I'm focusing solely on events mm-hmm. as a blogger, I don't have to worry about well, how do I edit a a video or how do I edit a photo or how do I create a blog post? Like I know that part. Mm -hmm. The only thing I have to um, focus on is the content. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but that took years, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I've been doing this for seven years, like, like you've been doing it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people just assume that if someone's name pops up, Oh, they just kind of popped on the scene, not realizing the time, the energy, mm-hmm. the money, the countless hours and nights and years that mm-hmm. someone put in yeah. to get to the point where people are like, oh, you just popped out on the scene. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I wish. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's really, and especially when you read about these stories and success stories and overnight successes and you follow someone on Twitter or whatever, like make sure you take the time to understand their true journey and the true privilege that they might've had and, you know, different set of life experiences because otherwise it's too easy to just feel bad about yourself, but, but it's, it's, yeah, it's not worth it. Um, the other thing is I think making sure that the businesses that you decide to work on are improving yourself. They're teaching you new skills that you can take somehow, you know, I've learned so many awesome things working on, on Gumroad and everything I've worked on before that. And I could totally do the same thing tomorrow, but I don't think I will because I want to learn more. I want to learn different, different things. And I think that's super, super, super important. Um, You should always work on a business that's going to be teaching you things. It shouldn't be like this crazy, comfortable uh, lifestyle for you Um, because you never know how you're going to take those skills and apply it to the next thing that you do. And then, you're, you're going to be able to do more stuff because these other things you don't have to think about anymore. They're easy. So you can now be more innovative and, and do, do more different things. And uh, when you, um, the four hour work week kind of popped into my head. A lot of people mm-hmm. read that book when it came out and yeah. they started only working four hours. It reminds <laughs> me of this episode of the profit on um, CNBC and Marcus Lemonis, the host, he went to this candy um, store in Florida. And one of the partners, he said he read the four hour work week. And so that's why he only showed up four hours a month to help with the business. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, okay, but it says work week, but he only showed up per month. And he just assumed that the business would make money because he read the book and he was following, um, what, what the book says. (laughs) And I think a lot of times people miss the the big point of the book he Mm -hmm. got to four hours a week because he put in years of perfecting systems and processes Mm -hmm. and knowing what his customer wanted and knowing who his customers were like it was a lot to go into 
that before he got to the point where he's like, okay, now I can do four hours because he has people who yeah. answer the emails or, or stuff like that. Yeah. But it just always tickles me when people. Yeah. I've met, read I've that. met Tim too. <laughs> I've met Tim a couple of times when he used to live in San Francisco. And it's funny because he works more than most people I know. You know, he probably does. <laughs> So yeah, it's all it's yeah. I think sometimes that message gets lost. I think the four-hour work week is kind of like a marketing slang, but really it's it's about automation. It's about thinking about how you can replace your job. But often those people never will. There's always going to be more to do and and more to do and more people to hire and more things to go tackle and more products to launch. And that type of person that you know, I always I always tell people I'm super lazy. I'm the laziest person. And that's why I work really hard because maybe if I work hard enough today, I'm not going to have to work tomorrow. And guess what? It doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, yeah. a good, it's a good way for me to think because it inspires me and it motivates me in this weird way. You know? And it's a little bit facetious too, but it helps me stay humble and say, okay, how do, I, how do I think about my day? Okay, what did I do today? How could I automate that? How could I hire someone to do that? Um, how could we change the product so that we don't have to answer those questions anymore, et cetera? No, you and I are like on the same path here because that's how I feel. I'm like, what can I do to make sure everything runs so smooth so that I'm not having to work 10 hours every single um, every single day? Because my ultimate goal is how much Netflix can I watch in that week? <laughs> what can I do to make sure every goal is met <laughs> so I can enjoy um, Netflix? To some people, they're like, that's kind of not a, a good goal. But I'm like, it makes you get creative. It makes you get yeah. really, really creative on trying to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Mm. Um, and then it also at the end of the week says, okay, well, I didn't meet this. What happened? What could have gone better? Could I have reached out to people to help me out? Or, you know, so it really makes you think of being a little bit more efficient or mm -hmm. at least, or at least that works for me. Try to be yeah. as, as efficient as possible. Yeah. So, um, this was a great, this was a great conversation. I think a lot of people are going to have to listen to it maybe two or three times mm -hmm. and take some notes because I was taking some notes as well. Mm -hmm. But um, before we head out from this episode, we're going to do our final toast. So, Sahil, what would you want people to walk away from this episode knowing? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I think, I think just when, just be careful, I think, of the word business, I'd say. And I think that feeds into a lot of the things that we talked about. Because um, I think a business, sometimes it just, it scares people. It, it's intimidating. It makes you think about money and this, you know, crazy um, thing that you're going to need to build at some point. And just start focusing on starting small, doing something that you love doing, building an audience, learning your craft, like focus on those things. And it, it can be an account, it can be a Twitter account, it can be an Instagram account, it can be a blog, it can be an email newsletter, it can be a book, a journal, what, like it, it can take whatever form it, 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 that works for you. It doesn't have to be a business today, you know? Um, everything can be, a, can be a business at some point. But I think sometimes I think, you know, I talk to folks and, and they just stress about, oh, how am I going to do this? And like, going to have to raise money and hire employees and deal with taxes. And it's like, well, you get all that stuff is going to be easy to deal with if you have a successful product. And if you're able to build an audience, that stuff, you people have done it for centuries. You can hire that stuff out. People are, that stuff's not difficult. Um, focus, the stuff that's really hard is, is, is making something that people really care about. Um, and benefiting people's lives, building something of value. The rest of the stuff will happen. So I, th I guess it's a question of focus. That was really, really good because um, a lot of people want to jump in with the business. And, and I like that, you know, it doesn't have to be a business at mm -hmm. the beginning. It, it can grow into that. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I would say that I would like people to walk away from is um, keeping things simple. You started Gumroad. You mm -hmm. created it very simple. Um, when I started blogging, I had just a simple idea. I wanted to be a voice for everyday women. And don't overlook the simple things in your life because those simple things may um, 
be the one thing to take you to wherever it is you want to go. So we've had a really, really great conversation. This has been a Toast to Truths with me, Vernetta Arfrini, and my guest co-host, Sahil Lavinia. This is season eight, episode two, Finding the Right Business for You. And we talked a little bit about the consequences we have encountered over the years. So thank you so much for tuning in and you will catch episode three next week. Go to VernettaRFreeny.com for the show notes. Make sure you go to VernettaRFreeny.com backslash category backslash podcast.